we're going to go ahead and get started. Fair enough? All right, thank you guys for coming out. Like I said, I think we had 15, 16 people signed up, so it's not quantity, it's what? Every time. All right, we've got 45 minutes. I what I wanted to do is actually focus in on a specific subject today, which is what we talked about, which is selling, but more clearly what I want to talk about is overcoming objections. And I throw this one up first because when I started doing the sales training program, I looked at a lot of the different sales training programs out there. I think I've looked at almost all of them, whether it's Miller Highland, Spin, uh, Sandler, you name them. I've gone through all these books and, you know, do some of these books look familiar to you guys? A lot of these look familiar, right? The sales Bible, Strategic Selling, all this stuff. As I was going through all this stuff, something started to hit me that a lot of this stuff is pretty much canned repeated, it's regurgitated, and coming from a background in sales, I started reading this stuff and I said, I can't do a program on this because you guys don't want to hear the basics. You don't want to hear about asking an open-ended question. You don't want to hear about uh, asking a closed-ended question, the basic sales process. So I started asking myself, as I look at all these different books, I said, you know, what could I do differently that would make a sales program worth attending? And so what I started doing is I started looking at this right here. Most of the programs today, when you go to the market, cover this right here, which is what? Strategic, strategy, tactic, psychology, and 98% of all the books, if you went to my website, you probably read this, 98% of all the books dedicated out there is how to what? How to sell people. And the thing is, people are getting smart. A lot of people know when you're trying to use a certain buying tactic on them or try to close them in a certain way. I've had people actually tell me, hey, if you're using the alternative, close on me. That's when you know you've been caught selling, right? That's when you kind of just throw your hands up, I've been caught selling. What started getting me fascinated about selling again was when I started looking at how people buy. I started looking at this side of the equation. In other words, what triggers behavior? What makes people want to buy? And that's when I created Sales Influence. Sales Influence, I think, is beyond the basic, and you'll see for yourself when we go through this, is beyond the basic sales training. Is what is it that makes people make certain decisions? Whether they're rational or irrational, what causes them to make certain decisions? And this is how this came about. About two years ago, I was consulting for a company out of Salt Lake City, Utah. They sold a software package, it's really two of them, for $3,000 and $6,000. They held public seminars. In these public seminars, we would get about 50 to 100 people. And the first time I was invited to see this sales process go, uh, it was amazing. Here's how it's set up, and here's why I'm here today. I was sitting in the back as a guest. They said, well, we want to see what we do and then tell us how you can improve the process. And it was amazing. They had about 100 people in the room. The average income, because they actually took the numbers down when people walked in and asked them to fill out a form, was about, I'm going to say, $30,000. Okay? Not top, not bottom, somewhere in the middle. Packages again, three to $6,000. At the end of the day, they closed about 30% of the room in one day. Run the numbers. I've been in situations where the worst we've done in one day was $50,000 in one day. The most we've ever done a day is $240,000 closed in one day. Some of the people who, if you looked at them, you said, you can't afford this. But some were in there, and they were able to what? Make the buying decision. And it was at that point I'm like, you know, if I could be so, well, what the hell is going on here? Well, how do they get these people to buy? And when the top sales guy, who was running all the seminars began to explain certain strategies to me, a lot of it started making sense because it was more psychological than anything else. This is what I want to share with you today because you get in front of whether it's an individual, in a meeting, big group, presentation, a client, and you want to try to persuade them. But persuade them in such a way that making the close becomes that much easier. And that's what we want to talk about today. So we're going to talk about overcoming objections. Now, whether or not you're in the high tech business, which I think most of you are anyway, whether or not you'll still be able to use these strategies. So let me kind of go through this real quick. How do you develop a persuasive presentation? Now, I'm not going to talk about presentation in the sense that how do you get up, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them what you told them, you know, and wrap it up that way. I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm talking about here is how do I develop a persuasive presentation, a dialogue with my client or my customer in such a way that by the time I get to the end, they're going to be somewhat compelled to buy from me. And so here's a typical business presentation that most of you probably do. You first start out with your company background. We've been building widgets for 20 years now. 
You know, we started when Bob was on the farm and he had this idea about building these widgets. You've all seen those presentations. Then you talk typically about your main clients. Well, these are the type of clients we've served in the past. This is who we worked with. And obviously, you try to find clients that are related to whoever you're talking to, as long as they're not a competitor. You then begin to talk about what? What you have to offer. We have these types of products, these types of services, and man, we're the best. And then you come in and you talk about demonstration and case studies. Or you talk about, you know, we've worked with X company, ABC company, this is what we've done for them, so forth and so on. Is all this sounding familiar? Okay, very basic, right? And the last part, you either get into the discussion of actual products that you want to sell the client, or you just put down a proposal. Now, all this can happen within one meeting, or it can happen in several phases if it's a complex sale. Now, a simple sale is obviously a small item that you can just buy on the spot. The complex sale is what? Something that takes, what, multiple visits to close. So this could actually happen, obviously, in three stages. What I'm proposing that the way most folks do this presentation is not hurting you, but it's not really helping you when it comes to closing the deal, or at least pushing the deal over the edge at the end. We're going to walk through that. 5%, if what I can show you, if what I can show you will help increase your rate, because most of you have been in sales for at least five years, raise your hand, just out of curiosity. 10, 15, 20. Okay, some of you have been in sales longer than I have, which means you probably know more than I do. But if I can show you one or two small tactics today that will help you increase your close rate by 5%, would that be worth it? Okay, that's what we're going to do today, okay? So, lines of thinking. Before I go into actual what I'm going to show you, let me take a step back and I want to explain to you something that these two folks did. These are two social psychologists and they did a fascinating test. What they did, they brought in a bunch of college students and what they wanted to do was test perception. Now here's what they did. They drew lines on the board and they asked them to estimate the length of these lines. Okay, everybody with me? They broke the students up into three separate groups. Group number one was asked to look at the lines and estimate how long they were, but they were only asked to think of the answer. In other words, to look up there and go, okay, these are my numbers, okay? The second group was asked to write their answers on a magic pad. You guys remember those? Where you actually write them, and then you what? Lift them, right? So the second group was actually wrote their estimates on the magic pad, lifted them so nobody else could see them, but they actually did commit it and then lifted everybody with me on that. The third group was asked to write their estimates down, sign it with their name, and then hand it in. Now here's what they were testing. They wanted to see, out of these three groups, which one was more willing to change their mind if presented with the real answers in other words, their answers weren't going to match whatever the students had, so they were going to present totally different answers. So what they found out was something interesting. The group one that didn't write it down were more easily swayed in the change in their mind. In other words, once the professor presented something and says, hey, your, your numbers are wrong, those who didn't write it down, who just thought about it, said, well, okay, yeah, you know, you're right, you're probably right. The second group who wrote it down on the magic pad a little more resistant, but in the end, guess what? They changed their mind. Those who wrote it down, actually committed it to paper, signed it, and handed it in, were, guess what? The most stubborn of all. They didn't want to change their mind. And what Gerard and Deutsch was trying to prove here is that once you commit to something, once you commit to something, you're, you're less likely to change your mind. And the more public you make it, guess what? The more likely you are not to change your mind. I want you to listen to that statement. The more public you make it, the less likely you are to change your mind. This is called the theory of cognitive dissonance, which is really the rule of consistency, which means we act in according to our behavior. Our belief system and our actions have to be congruent. If they're not, guess what? We're not going to behave that way. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Here's the definition. Inconsistency among beliefs or behaviors will cause what is known as an uncomfortable psychological tension. Now, that sounds a little complicated, but truly, really, it's very easy to understand. How many times did you say you were going to do something, and for some reason, you didn't do it or you got out of it? You told a friend you were going to show up to help move, but guess what? 
You came up with some excuse of why you didn't want to help or couldn't show up. And after you did that, you felt a little what? Uncomfortable. By the way, am I alone here? Just give you a nod to make sure we're on the same page here, right? You feel that tension inside. What people will do is they'll move to relieve that tension by acting what? Congruently. Which is why when we say things, we try to act congruently with what we've said or what we've publicly stated. Here's why this is important. Let me give you four examples. Placing bets. Studies have shown that after you place a bet, after you place a bet, you are more likely to believe that your horse is going to win, for example. In other words, no sooner than you place the bet, in your mind, the odds have gone up. Why? Because your belief has to match your what? Your actions, so you have to bring them into alignment. Here's another one, hung jury. Did you know the studies have shown that you have more hung juries when votes are asked to be taken by a show of hands as opposed to writing them down privately? How many of you folks have seen that movie by Henry Fonda, 12 Angry Men? Right? And that whole process is once you make a commitment, you want to stick to that commitment. Now, in the movie, they had what? Four or five hours to change somebody's mind. But if we're talking to a customer, we don't have four or five hours to talk to somebody to change their mind. Most people, once they make a, a public commitment, will stick to it. Charity support. The American Cancer Society, and this is something very interesting. They call people up and see if you've gotten this phone call. And they, and they just ask you to predict what is the likelihood of you contributing to a charity? Just what is the likelihood? And you say, well, you know, it's the right charity. Guess what? I contribute. Fine. Click, thank you very much. They hang, you hang up. Two weeks later, guess what? They call up. The American Cancer Society has seen a 700% increase in donations by simply using this two-step tactic. The first step is to get you to what? Say that you're going to publicly state that you would what? Help charities. Well, when they call you up and call you on it, again, the rule of consistency kicks you in the gear and says, you know, and wham, next thing you know, you're giving up your money to charity. Not a bad thing, but understand what's happening to you psychologically. Voter turnout. Studies have shown that just by simply asking people, do you intend to vote this year, voting turnout will go up 25%. Isn't that amazing? Because again, you made the statement, and then later on, even though that person who asked you is gone, the psychological attention is there to what? Be consistent with what you said. Now, here's the general rule. The more public the commitment or the statement, the more public the statement, the more you are likely to act accordingly. Is everybody with me on this? Okay? All right. Everybody got that down? I'll give you a moment to write that down. And I know what you're thinking, Victor, what does all this have to do with sales? I'm getting there. It'll all start making sense in a bit, and you're going to see why this is so powerful when you apply. So go ahead and write that down. By the way, am I going too fast, too slow, or just right? No. Yeah. Okay. circle back to why this is important. Selective perception is what we choose to see. Has this ever happened to you? You buy a car, no sooner than you buy a car, what do you start noticing on the road? That very same. car, uh, right? That same car. Now, nothing happened. The fact that your mind is now oriented to actually what? See that car because you own it, you begin to see the car. Let's go back to consistency. If you're a Democrat or a Republican, what happens is, you say, you publicly state, I'm a Democrat, or you publicly say, I'm a Republican. What will happen from that point forward, whether you watch the media, read the newspaper, you will look for information to validate your point of view. In other words, you will look for information that supports and suppress, so to speak, to the side, that which conflicts with your belief system. Because again, you want to maintain that congruency, that consistency. So what happens is, this perception can help or hurt you, and later on I'm going to talk to you about how this can hurt you with the client if we do it the wrong way. And again, 
just to give you a chance to get there. Here's a summary. Inconsistency between what you say and what you do will cause psychological tension. We're all clear on that, right? Not a bit. This will lead people to change their be beliefs to benefit their actual behavior. Okay, I know I'm being redundant, but I want to drive this point home because you can learn all the sales techniques in the world, but if you don't understand the underlying psychological process of why people make decisions, it's not going to help you. Once you really get what I'm trying to teach you here, everything you do from now on will have a different twist. So, everybody jot that down? Give me a moment to write that down. <clears throat> I haven't gotten to the fun stuff yet, by the way. link on the website so you guys can look at it later on if you have to, okay? Alright, what does all this have to do? The cycle battle will have to do with selling, right? Now, here's what we're going to get into. Sales success. Would you agree with this? In any sales process, before I can begin selling, I have to reduce sales resistance. In other words, if the person doesn't want to buy, they're not going to want to buy. Now, you can read all the books on sales resistance, how to reduce it. I'm not going to go into that right now, but you know it's all building credibility, trust, you know, building rapport, charisma, well, you know, just to get the client to what? Open up. Once you can reduce that resistance and they trust you a little bit, then you can begin to increase what? Sales acceptance. In other words, if I can get you to lower your defense shields, then I can begin what? Start selling you on what I have to offer. Record that. Now, sales objections. Publicly stated opposition to a concern or a concern. Based on what I've talked about so far, that if somebody publicly commits or publicly states that they're for or against something, they will stick to it. When somebody makes a sales objection, what they've done is they've made it what? Public. And because they've made it public, they're less likely to want to what? Change their mind. Now, let's walk through some scenarios here because I really want you to get this. If I'm in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I'm trying to sell my friend here, even if he makes an objection, that's publicly stated, it's only between what? Us. I can still probably what? Overcome the objection and turn them. Now, let's go to a meeting like this. We're all sitting, I'm doing the customer presentation, I want you to buy my product. All of a sudden, my friend here says, I don't like that. Wham, he's just made a public statement amongst his colleagues, which means that now I have to work on what? Overcoming that objection, but now it also what? Everybody's now what? cognitively aware of that objection. So one of the things I want to talk about today is how do we handle objections? Here's some basic routines we see in a meeting. People will always object to price, correct? Price is always an issue. So you have to, you find yourself in a position, my friend here said, well, Victor, your prices are too expensive. All of a sudden, I'm up here as a presenter, now I have to what? Justify why my prices are higher. We've all been in that situation. Delivery. Somebody says, Victor, your turnaround time stinks. So then, what do you have to do? Convince them that your process has gotten better or whatever, your service has gotten better and you can meet those deliveries. Support. We don't think you can support you know, us, whether it's 24 hours, 365, we don't think you can support us, so your job is to what? Reassure them. Now, you've also heard this one, capabilities. Let's say you're selling a technology product. They're gonna say, well, does it do this? You ever notice that no matter what presentation you walk into where you sell a high-tech product, there's always something that you don't have. And there's always somebody in that room who's going to find that something you don't have, right? They always do. And then you find yourself, what? Trying to describe how you can work around the issue, how you can tag it on to something or else how we're going to have it later on. So there you're, you're, you're going for the description. The last one here is aesthetics. By that I mean, well, the box is too big. Well, the box is too small. 
Well, the box is purple, I would like it blue. You get the idea? And then we have to what? Defend why we designed it a certain way. These are typical what? Objections that we face in sales. You can probably come up with a longer list if we sat here long enough. Here's the problem. You're having to explain these objections. And what I just told you is that once somebody makes a public objection, especially in a public forum, they're less likely to want to change their position. So one of the things we want to do is make sure these objections don't happen. A friend of mine told me this a long time ago. You might want to write it down if you haven't heard it, but I thought it was the cleverest line. He says, in any conversation or presentation, he said, if you're explaining, you're losing the conversation. And I thought that was powerful, because if you're explaining, you're losing the conversation. That means the customer has basically pushed you back on your heels, and guess what? You're sitting there going, how do I explain this? How do I explain away all these different things? And if you've been in that situation, and I'm sure we've all been in that situation where the customer caught you off guard and now you're in the explaining mode, sorry to say it, but you're at a disadvantage at this point. At this point, you're not even at zero. You're at negative trying to get back to zero, and all of a sudden you're behind the eight ball. So one of the things we want to do is avoid any objections being made. So the after effect, let's go back to selective perception. If everybody, somebody in here makes an objection, whether it's on price, capability, or whatever I just listed, those five, I'm gonna leave the meeting. Let's say I finish, I wrap up the meeting with you guys. I leave the meeting. What's gonna happen is those objections are gonna grow legs. By that I mean, if somebody brought up the price, I'm gonna go, you know, I didn't like the price. Did you like the price? He goes, well, yeah, I wasn't too crazy about the price. And then all of a sudden, this is start, what? It's like an infectious viral disease. Capabilities. Well, you know, they didn't have that. Well, you know, I noticed that they didn't have this either. And all of a sudden, they're starting to see what they want to see. Why? Because they've publicly objected that they don't like your pricing or they don't like your product. And if they don't like your product, what they're going to do is what? Behave what? Consistent with what they've stated. And they will selectively look for information to undermine why they should buy from you and that can spread. So what we have to do as salespeople is to prevent that from ever starting. So this is what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about overcoming objections because that's old school, that's the way it used to be done, it's still done today. Because as I'm just stating, if it's stated publicly, we're at a disadvantage. So what I want to do is I want to go beyond this and I want to introduce you to something that's called blocking objections. And by blocking objections, I'm saying, I want to block any objection before it becomes an objection. If I can do that, I think I stand a better chance of closing the deal. Let me show you how we're going to do that. How do you block an objection? The old-fashioned way. By what? By raising it. We all know this, right? That if I raise the objection, I now own the objection. And I can dispense with it any which way I like. So in other words, by raising the objection, I am now in control of the conversation. If the client raises the objection, guess what? I have to defend it. So what I want to do is raise it. Because now, if I raise it, I own it. If I own it, I control what I do with it. And I'm going to show you how you do this and how you're going to dispense with objections. Here's a statement by Lee Dubois. Salespeople put too much emphasis on the closing, closing the sale. You used to read some of these books, and all they do is focus on sales. You, you know, you watch the movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, whatever it is. You know, A, B, C, always be closing. And, you know, you go through some of these books, Tom Hopkins, and they give you a hundred ways to close the client. The problem is, in a simple sale, that may work. In a complex sale, it doesn't work. And people are smart. They know when to try to close them. So he says, if you remove the objections up front, or well, I'll say during the sales process, the closing should just be a matter of what? Pushing them over the line. Okay? Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to hand out this sheet right now. Yes, we're going to do some homework. Because I want you to walk out of here being able to use this. All right. so. What I want you to do is on this sheet, just look at the left-hand column at the top, left-hand column at the top, and it says client objections. Okay, so client objections. There's two right there. Two right there. And just out of curiosity, or just for the sake of this example, what I want you to do under client objections, at the top list, one objection, so in other words, at the top, put one of your typical customer objections. Just go ahead and write one of your typical customer objections. At the bottom, write a second one. So at the top, right here, I'd like you to write one of your 
client's objection. What typical objection do you get? If it's price, put price. If it's some capability, put capability. And then below also do the same thing. So I want you to write two separate objections. I need you to write this down because I'm going to ask you to do something. Now, out of curiosity, what are, some, what are, two, what are your two? First one is price and service. Price and service? It's capability of the system outside. Okay, so capability, okay? Okay. Same Same? <laughs> what do you ask? Price, everybody's got the price. <laughs> budget. Budget? They don't have a budget? Right. Budget's not available till next year or something like that. Not available or till next year. What's yours back here? Well, I had one yesterday where a guy just said, we're, we're just not interested in that right now. Okay, not now. Yeah, okay, now. perfect. We'll get to that one in a bit. What do you got? Uh, under long term agreements with others. Okay, so they're, they're locked into a contract. Okay? Uh, budget and capability. Budget and capability. So we're pretty much in the same area. All right. Keep those in mind because what I want to do is show you now how you're going to start handling some of these things. Uh, we're going to fill this worksheet out, but just give me a minute to go through this. Let's say that these are the five objections we typically get. Okay? What I want to do right now is to develop a presentation that would actually block all these five objections. Let me slow down because I want to make sure you get this. Let's say that I'm coming to your company and I'm doing a presentation. Before I walk in that door, I know what your five objections are going to be because I've either talked to enough customers where I already know what the top five are going to be. What I will then do is build a presentation around those what? Five objections, okay? Now, when you look at these sheets, here's what I want you to see in your mind. Don't write anything down. This is what I want you to visually see. Every row right here, when we fill this out, that's one slide that you're going to do as a presentation, okay? Every, every objection will have its own slide, and I'll show you that in just a minute. I need you to write this down. This is important because this is the crux of why we're here today, and this is what I learned, and I'm trying to share with you because this stuff is not theoretical. This stuff works. And so as you're writing, all you need to do is listen to my voice. This is called the blocking commitment structure. At the top, you see you have to state the problem, or we'll say state the objection. So what you're going to do is you're going to state the objection in your presentation. So if it's pricing, you're going to state that objection. Second in the process, you're going to offer to resolve that objection. You're going to offer to resolve that objection. Then you're going to demonstrate how you're going to do that. And then I'm going to tie you down for an agreement. So as you're writing down, you know what I want you to make sure you write the triangle out. Because the triangle is, is such a visual that you will not forget it later on. And there's a reason there's a triangle, because at the end you're going to tie them down to a commitment, and we're going to talk about that. So again, step number one, state the problem or state the objection. Now again, this is me doing the presentation. I'm going to state the problem or state the objection up front. Once I state the objection, then I'm going to talk about resolving that objection from the front of the room. Then I'm going to demonstrate how I can do that. And then I'm going to ask them for a commitment and tie them down to an agreement on that point. Let me give you an example here in just a bit. For example, here's an example of a typical client. If you're selling software, here's a typical client objection. Software's too complicated. I'm a technophobic. I'm a technophobe. Your software's too complicated. I don't think my people could use your software. Okay? Let's use that as a typical objection. Now, I know that when I walk in to do this presentation, there's somebody in this room that's going to say, the software's too complicated, Victor. That's why we can't use this. So what I want to do is walk into the room and what? Block the objection. So here's the process for blocking an objection. What I do is I create a problem statement, an objection statement. Many of our existing clients think our software is too hard to use, and that's understandable. So let me, let me make sure I'm clear here. I, I'm doing my presentation, and I said, look, now, many of our people, before looking at our software, always tell me that it's too complicated, and that's understandable. So what did I just do? I just raised the objection. I then say, let me show you how easy it is to use that even you'll agree that you can use it. Now, you can add a story, or whatever you want to do. You can add anything in here. The story I always add with this one is, you know, how many folks remember driving sticks for the first time? I usually get hand, right? I said, do you remember the first time you tried to drive a stick? Remember? Clutch in, first gear, hit the gas pedal, nothing happens, right? Then somebody yelled, let the clutch go, and the car jackrabbits. But, so for the first week, it was really hard to do. But within a week or two, what were you doing? 
cruising around, okay? So in other words, you can find your way of doing it, but first state the objection, and then say, look, I'm gonna resolve it for you by telling you how easy it is to use. Then I'll show them how to use the software. And obviously, because we're salespeople, what are we gonna do? Show them the easy windows first, right? Just show them the easy stuff first. Look, if you just wanna do this operation, click, 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 click. Once you do that, here's where you have to ask for the tie down and the commitment. Because what you want to do is, based on what I've shown you, how many of you think you can do this with a little practice? And you're usually going to get some, yeah, I think I can do that. With that thing right there, that little presentation, mini presentation, I've just blocked anybody who's going to bring up the subject later on about whether my software is too complicated or not. Is this starting to make sense? So, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, just do the wheel. Right. So make it make it in such a way that you're walking through the process. So step four for you guys is always to come up with a what? A list of objections before you want to see a client. Before you go see a client, I would ask you to do this exercise for each of the objections. So you have the questions down and you have the statements, but in your head I want you to have that structure. State the objection, then tell them you're going to resolve the objection, then demonstrate, and then say what? You tie them down at the end and ask for a mental commitment. When I ask you, how many of you would agree with that? What am I asking for? A mental commitment to what I've just said. So that when you leave the room, you're not gonna have that discussion about how the software is too hard to use, or else you would have brought it up while we were discussing it. See what we're trying to do? So we're also trying to block any after effects. Now, here's what I want you to keep in mind. Consistency can work for us and against us. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing. But we're going to make it a good thing. It'll work against you as we've described already. If somebody declares, I don't like your product, that's it. I don't want to say you're screwed, but you're at a disadvantage, right? If they say it out loud. So blocking objections is the only way to cure that problem, by just blocking the objection before it comes up. Here's how it can work for you. If I get you to say yes, I agree. I like that. I see what you're saying, Victor. I understand. All of a sudden, I'm gaining what? Commitment. Remember what I said earlier? I showed you this thing. Let's go back. The software's too complicated. What I'm trying to do is reduce resistance right here. Because when I bring up the objection, several things are going through your mind. Damn, that's what I was thinking about. That that software's too complicated. And then you're also thinking, wow, he's pretty straightforward about it. You know, he's not going to hide the fact that it's a little, maybe a little tough. And all of a sudden, I'm building what? Credibility and trust. I'm just reducing resistance, that's all I'm doing. When I offer to resolve it, I add that term, you'll agree. Because sales 101 is to make the assumptive what? Statement. Yeah, you're gonna love this. Oh, you'll agree with that. You'll, you'll see how easy this is. All I'm doing is what? Reducing the resistance. When I demonstrate and I come to the end, what am I doing? Now I'm asking you for your what? Your commitment at the end. It's a simple structure, but powerful. And all you gotta do is figure out how to combine this in your sales presentation. Okay? Any questions on this? Or is this too straightforward? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very simple formula to get it done. And you won't get the ooh ah until you start doing it. <laughs> and every time in your mind, what I want you to visualize is that if you're doing a presentation, I got all these objections that have come up. When you look at your presentation, instead of talking about how your company's been around for 20 years building widgets, or doing this and how many clients you have, screw that. You're gonna say, okay, let's talk, whatever, capabilities first. Uh, second is sometimes I'll ask you, you know, well, how long has your company been around, right? So you know that all of a sudden, tenure is gonna be an objection. How do you handle tenure? That you've only been around for two years. You can remember, if I bring up the objection, look, I've only been in business two years, our company's been around for only two years. Now, many people think that that's a, I'm making this up as I go along, by the way. Many people think that that's not a long time. But one of, would you agree, again, would you agree that being a young company allows us to be more flexible and help you in designing something that's new and for today or for tomorrow? Yeah, well, let me show you what we do. You know, and all of a sudden, you've overcome that mental objection. Again, what you're trying to do is block people from thinking what you don't want them to think. All right, so your turn to do an example. Pick one of the objections you have. Go back to the worksheet I gave you. Pick one of the examples I just gave you uh, that you've written down, whether it's price, uh, don't use price, because I just show, well, use price. Go ahead and use price if you want. Uh, whatever objection you have, and walk through the steps. So here's what I want you to do. Let me be clear. You've stated an objection up here, right? Let's say it's price. 
I need you to write the problem statement. In other words, what do you think a problem statement will be for price? In fact, I'm not going to help you. I'm going to make yourself do what? Based on what I told you, you got to state the problem, right? Yeah. Let me just think. The problem statement is what the cust potential customer is saying to you. Is the objection that they're going to bring up. Yeah, that's so what it is. Their I objection. In fact, why don't you slash problem, put objection statement. Cross out problem and put objection statement. That'd probably be easier. So in other words, you know that the client has an objection. So you've walked into a presentation. What's your objection statement? In other words, because what you want to do is raise the objection before they do. So with the software, the objection was, it's too complicated. So my problem statement was, here, let me go back so maybe you can use this as a guide. Use this as a guide. So here was the objection, okay? So what I did is I turned it into a statement, okay? So in other words, software's too complicated. Most people think our software's too complicated, and that's understandable. If you have price, what would you say? How would you rephrase that? If price is an objection, how would you restate that? Fees are too high. You know, you're too expensive. You're too expensive. You don't have budget for that. No, no. Remember, here's where I want to be clear. I'm glad you asked that because okay. I think you're missing this. Remember, the client has an objection in his mind. Your price is too high. Right. When you walk in to do the presentation, well, how do I state it? How, how would they state it? How would I state it? How would you state it? There you go. How would you state it? Because remember, what we want to do is, is raise the objection ourselves. Okay. So what do you got back here? So, so two is what the customer says to you, and three is your way to try to control that. Let me stop. I, I'm not explaining correctly. I apologize. I'm, 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 I'm failing. Here's the client's objection. Right. That's his objection. Okay. You now have to raise the objection. You have to raise the objection from the front of the room. This is all you right here. Okay. You walk in, and the client has an objection. Okay, so step one, the client has an objection. If I know what the objection is, step one, let me write an objection statement. So from the front of the room, I would say something like, you know, many of our existing clients, again, think the software is too complicated. Is everybody with me now? And then once I bring it up, I have to find a way to give a resolve statement. And I have an example in here for pricing, so if you're not getting it, I have an example for pricing in here, so it'll help you out. It's a new concept, but once you get it, it'll be like, it'll be like butter, as they say. I got it. Got it? It takes a while to go click, but once it goes click, and remember, you're in a presentation, maybe mentally see yourself doing a presentation in front of the front of the room, you know that the client has an objection. If the client has an objection, then I have to go through this four-step process. I have to raise the objection, I have to set, tell them I'm gonna resolve that objection, then I'm gonna show and tell, Right? And then I will say, based on what I've shown you, would you agree that even you can do that? Okay? Let me give you an example and maybe we'll close in. This, okay. Is it getting there? Who's done with theirs? All the way through. All five. I want you to go all the way through. This is homework, folks. All the way through. Because this is what you're going to use to build your presentation from now on if you choose to use this model. And I'm telling you, it's a very, very powerful model. But you have to do it in order to get it. Okay. What are you using as your objection? Pricing? Yes. Okay. So now here, your problem statement would be something like, let's say pricing. Right here, your problem statement would be something like, one of the things our clients often tell us is that our pricing is too high. Boom. There's your, there's your problem statement. I just raised the objection. Then, the question is, how do you resolve that statement? I'm not going to give the answer, but you're going to come up with a way that you can have the answer. No, I'm not going to give the answers. I want you to work for the answer on that one. And for show and tell, unless you can show, you don't have to really put anything down. But if you can demonstrate it on paper, that's fine. You're all the way through? Did you go all the way through all five? All right. Why don't we go? Give me yours out loud first. Give me your objection. Uh, budget because of the economy. Okay, so budget because of the economy. Not price, but budget. Like it's, not, it's not in our budget. Yes. I'm, I, I think money kind of ties with that sense of time. Now okay. is not the time. Now is not the time. We don't have the budget money. It's not the time. Not the time. Okay. okay. The well, time let's, do, right. let's do this, Jack. Let's go through this one, and then let's. Do you have all yours written down all the way through? Uh, Show and tell yeah, the last year. 
Why don't you go, let's walk through yours first. And, okay, so you walk into the room. You know, one of the things they're going to bring up is what? We don't have the budget at this time. The economy. The economy, right? It's the economy. So what's your objection statement? What did you write down? How do you bring up the objection? Uh, I'm not trying to sell you anything. All I'm trying to do is learn more about your business so I can... No, 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 no. You missed it. But that's okay. That's why you're here. You have to bring up the specific objection. In other words, in their mind, oh, 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 No, that's great. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of folks tell me that right now, that because of the economy, that their budgets you. are delayed till next year or third quarter of next year, however. Okay. Is that, is that what that's it. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Don't throw in the however. Exactly. Okay. Because <laughs> however triggers people to go, what? What do you mean however? It's like a dismissal. Don't do that. So the first statement is what you just said. Yeah. And then... Look at the, uh, now your resolve statement would be what? What would be a good resolve statement for a budget? In other words, I, I, I stand up here and I go, you know, most of our clients tell us that now's not the right time because of the economy and the money is not in their budget. Next step would be what? What do you think based on the resolve statement? From a thought process, mm -hmm. I'd be trying to get a great relationship and meet with them today mm -hmm. so when the timing is right, mm -hmm. you know, I can understand their business and be able to provide them a solution to that. Okay. So I buy that. I buy that. I buy that. How about this one? Try this one as well. That's not wrong, but try this one as well. People always say they don't have the money, but I, I've often found out that when they really want it, they find, if not all the money, just a little bit of the money. And so maybe one of your resolve statements could be, and again, I know it depends on the client, so I'm just trying to give you some breathing room here. One of the things I would try is, and that's understandable, budgets are tight, but if I can show you that we have several ways of packing this up that it will fit any budget. Would you agree that that would be one step forward for us? <clears throat> you see what I mean? In other words, I want to go in here and I want to get a $30,000 service contract, right? But they're going, it's not in my budget. Well, that's okay. Then I want to get my foot in the door. So what you're basically setting them up for is maybe you only give me a $5,000 contract, depending on the client. See what I'm on? So I'm trying to position you so you be able to get something. Because my whole theory is if I'm in front of you, I'm walking out that door with something, you know, or at least some type of commitment. So what you want to do is make a budget statement, which I like, I like yours, and then try to resolve it by saying, if we can offer you something, do you have anything else? What would you offer for that? What would you offer for a resolve statement to help them out? What else you got? I'm going to show you several things that maybe you haven't heard before about our product line that I think you'll agree at the end that could be uh, in your budget, perhaps with a lease program instead of a direct purchase. Get the idea? So all of a sudden, he, the objection was thrown out. He's going to say, I'm going to resolve it for you. And then he's, he set himself up perfectly because you said we have several what? Things you haven't heard of. So now you go into the show and tell process, and now you're able to what? Show the different things. And if you know a budget is an issue, what you're going to do is you're going to show them the high one first. You always start with the high price, by the way. I always throw the big ticket item at first because if you try to go from small to big, that's not good. Studies have shown that you always want to sticker shock them at the beginning. I'll give you an example. If you walk into a men's store and you let's say you're the salesman, you walk into my store and you're looking for a suit and a sweater, what should I sell you first? What should I start selling you first? The suit. Because you'll buy a $1,000 suit, $500, whatever it is, and then I'll just say, hey, throw in the sweater for another 50 bucks. But if I try to sell you a $50 sweater and then you try to sell them a $500 suit, then I go, no, 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 I'm not doing that. You see the difference? So you always want to make sure you throw the high item first and then come down. And by the way, studies have shown, again, from a, from a decision-making standpoint, never offer more than three options. Okay? Never offer more than three options, so that's a good thing to know. And most likely people, if they're confused, will always choose the middle option. Now, you're probably saying, well, Victor, I only have two options. Well, guess what? Create a third one. When you create a third one, we call that the decoy. The decoy is usually something so high that nobody's going to buy it anyway, but people will buy the what? The one in the middle, typically. So never offer more than three options, okay? So once you do the demo, that you show them all the different products that you have, different derivatives what, that you have that you can sell, then at that point, you want to make a commitment statement. So let's tie it up. What would be your commitment statement? Either one. Let him go ahead. Okay. My whole, uh, my whole thing is to just get the meat. Okay. Just get I'm not trying to sell it anything. Okay. Well, At all. Don't lose space. Okay. Price, but I said, uh, 
now that you've seen some of the features of voice over IP, wouldn't you agree this is good technology and something you could use today? Okay, now remember, you got to tie it back into what you've presented and the well, original you objection. The original, I said, we often hear voice, voice over IP is too expensive. Oh, okay, so you're going to that one. Okay. So now you, when you come back to the end, you're saying, you're not going to see how reasonable it is. Yeah. That's all you're doing. That's all you're doing. And by the way, this works on a one-on-one -on -one conversation as well. When you're discussing anything with somebody, you can usually use this mentally in your head. Like, look, Bob, I know you're not going to want to let me 100 bucks. I understand that. Right? <laughs> I understand that. Because most people, when I ask for 100 bucks, they're not giving it to me anyway. But if I can show you how I can invest this $100 and make it reasonable for both, because I'll pay it back, would you agree? And I'll say, yeah, I agree. So I show, okay, here's how you're going to get your money back. Now, based on what I've shown you, Bob, give me 100 bucks. It's almost a no-brainer. Would you agree? You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> it's, it, it is a process, but if you stick to the process, so here's what I want you to visually see: that if every slide you have, it can be a slide or two, doesn't have to, there's no rule, but if every slide has an objection blocker tied to it, what I'm doing is I'm first blocking the pricing objection, capability, whatever, uh, delivery, service. That by the time I've blocked all these, when I get to the end. I'll have less resistance and more acceptance. Let me give you another example of the one I use. This one. This is what people often tell me when I offer my sales training services. Victor, I don't need any sales training. I've been in it for many years. Right? What did I tell you this morning? Remember what I, how did I open up with? Remember I said, how many people have been here five years? Ten years? Twenty years? And then I made a statement. Hell, many of you probably know more than me. Why did I do that? Because, first of all, I have salespeople in the room. And some of you think you're very good salespeople. So I know that the only way to reduce resistance is to say, you know more than I do. And all of a sudden, even if you're a know-it-all, you've kind of lowered your defense shields a little bit. You did. And then I said, this was a statement. And then I said, but if I can show you. Remember I made the statement? And I showed you that 5%. If I can show you a couple of things, and you guys said, yeah, maybe that'd be great. So now I'm going to the show and tell, and then at the end, I'll say, you know, based on what I've shown you today, do you think you can use some of this stuff to increase your sales by 5%? And you're almost like, yeah, I think I can do this, Victor. So basically, even in what I did to you guys is what I use all the time. And it's amazing what will happen as you work this through your process. So again, get the visual in. When you're doing a presentation, before you go in to see the customer, I don't care who it is, and what conversation you're having, every objection should be included. So as you're looking at your PowerPoint presentations that you're going in, you gotta ask yourself, okay, here's my list of objections. Are they answered, are they brought up, resolved, and tied down in my presentation? Most of us don't have the tie down. That's what I've noticed a lot of people don't have. A lot of people, what they'll do is say, okay, you know, I have this box, and here's what the box does. It has all these capabilities, and I demonstrate the capabilities, and then I go, what do you think? That's typically the sales presentation I say. So based on what you know, what do you think? It's not what do you think. I mean, I need a commitment. But the thing is, you can't ask for a commitment at the end if you didn't start out with the what? An objection at the beginning that you're trying to resolve. So one has to lock the other down. So again, reduce sales resistance by what? Blocking the objections, because that's all we're doing. And I know I'm repeating this, but as you're going through the process, I'm also asking, would you agree? Does that make sense? And all of a sudden, start working this into your vocabulary. And so, you did the exercise. So when you're looking at this presentation, you would now do this differently, I'm sure. If you want to talk about your company's background, that's fine. But then, why? You say, well, Victor, I need to establish credibility. Well, beautiful. Then that's your objection. That's the objection. We've been around for X amount of years, whatever it is. Build that around that. Main clients. Why would you bring up main clients? I don't know. You want to prove what? Again, that you've done it, you have the experience. So really in that case, experience is the question. So you would stand in front of the room. Customers always ask us about our experience with clients, similar to yourself. I brought up the objection. You know, what we're going to show you is that we have X amount of clients that we've done business with. Let me go and show you a couple of case studies. Show and tell. Based on what I've shown you, can you see some similarities in your business and what they're doing? Absolutely. Does it seem too easy or what? It's just me. It's, it's really cool when you just kind of move along. So again, step one, let's go through it. Make sure you got these basic steps down. List the objections. This is how you prepare for a presentation. List the objections out. 
take time to do this. Take time to do this. Don't be, there's too many lazy, lazy salespeople out there who just say, I'm the winner and I'll just wing it. No, don't wing. Don't wing it. Go in there and say, say to yourself, what are they going to object to? What's in their mind? What are they going to object to? List them up and then use the block structure, the block commitment structure I just showed you, the four step process. And then, like anything else, I'm not going to go into the last part, which is what? Summarize everything you've talked about. As good salespeople, you know that at the end, when you're all done, you're going to say, you know, based on what I've showed you about my company's experience, based on the products we've shown you and what we can do and the capabilities, based on this, based on that, you know, right now, then you're going to ask for that commitment statement. That's another seminar. Because at that point, you can ask for different ways to make a commitment. You know, you know, you want to get the process started. When should we get the process started? Ask for something. Yes. I was just going to say, I apologize because my objection comes just trying to get that meeting at first. Meeting? Yeah. I have misunderstood. No, that's okay. That's this okay. This is for the presentation. This is for the presentation when you're walking in. But uh, go to my website. I have a, give me your email and I'll send you a book I just wrote. It's called Cold Calling Success, How to Get the Appointments. And how to get the appointments is really just about getting the appointments because uh, studies have shown that if you're in front of the client, 67% if not better, you'll close whatever deal you're going to close. It's just getting in the front door that's becoming that much more difficult. You know, the gatekeepers are becoming worse now. You know, everybody's overloaded. Nobody wants to, you know, talk to anybody. So that's the tough part. So I hear you. That's, that's painful. And that's the reality of it. People always ask me, does cold call work? I said, it works. But it's painful. But it also depends on what you're selling. And in the book, what I talk about and I show you is that if, it, if you're selling something that's not a lot of money, cold calling doesn't work because it's not worth it. But if you're you're looking at the, you know three four hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is, you know it starts, it, it's worth it if you're doing cold calling. So again, yeah. but anyway, I digress. Summarize at the end. And so here's the rules of consistency: it can work for you against you. Again. I'm giving you the basics, and this we've talked about already, tying them down. And use this, again, in your different presentations. Here's what the guy said at the end. I'm going to wrap it up. If I went too quickly, again, I can stand up here and give you a lot of fluff, but I'd rather just give you something that you can walk out of here and go, man, I can use that. So when you go back, reformulate your presentation or whatever you do as far as giving the presentation to make sure this uh, meets this commitment. Salespeople put too much emphasis on the closing. If you remove the objections up front, does this start to make more sense now? Because if you remove the objections up front, I modified it, here's what I would say. If you block the objections up front and you gain the commitment throughout the process, selling somebody becomes that much easier. That's what you have to do. And I'm telling you, it works. It's not speculation, but you have to work it into your presentation. Question? Thought? Okay, you're just thinking.